open our Bible, shall we, to the book of Acts chapter 15. Our readings will begin with verse number 36. Today's message is entitled, The Next Step, The Next Step. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in every town where we have preached the message of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul did not think it appropriate to take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. There was a sharp disagreement that they parted company, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul, I'm sorry, then Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. The next step. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, you said follow you, and Father, we desire to follow the footsteps of Jesus. And now, gracious Father, help us to anticipate the next step and be your willing servants. We ask this all in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. During the, month of April, during the month of May all across America, there are commencements in which millions of young people participate. And no sooner than they walk across the stage, receive congratulations, hugs, and kisses, they're asked the question, what is next? College, graduate school, work, travel, marriage, internship, or perhaps starting a business? And regardless of whatever stage you may find yourself in, all of us are confronted either with the next step or the final step, whether it be now or in the short future. But whatever step it may be, it may be met with disagreement. A very wealthy man was dying and decided to face up to the fact he called his attorney to his bedside after telling his wife not to cry, he started to dispose of all of his worldly possessions I want to leave my Cadillac to my son, George. His wife, Bertha, interrupted and said, quote, you should leave it to Joe. He's a better driver, and he'll take care of it. Okay, the man said. He went on, I want to leave my Rolls Royce to my daughter, Linda. His wife, Bertha, interrupted again and said, quote, you're better off if you leave it to your nephew, Willie. All right, he said, I'll leave my Rolls Royce to my nephew, Willie, instead of my daughter, Linda. He went on, quote, I'll leave my Volvo to my niece, Sally. She's such a sweetheart. Again, his wife, Bertha, interrupted and said, I think Judy should get it. Unable to take it any longer, the man said, Bertha, please, who's dying, you or me? <laughs> a naive Christian couple both believed that because they loved each other and they loved the Lord that they were going to live in peace and never have a disagreement or an argument. They soon discovered it didn't work that way. The longer they were married, the more they disagreed and the more they argued. The wife was really disturbed. She didn't believe in divorce, so finally one day she said to her husband, quote, honey, let's just pray to the Lord that he would take one of us home and then I'll go and live with my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, these two accounts are rather lighthearted, but some of you are facing some troublesome decisions regarding the next step. Do I sell my home and move into assisted living facility? Do I move back to assist my ailing parents? Do I keep my loved one on a ventilator or do I remove all artificial support? Do I sign the divorce papers or not? Do I sell my business or do I hold off? There is a range of categories that we could assign involving the next step, but perhaps there are three common ones. They are personal next step decisions, professional next step decisions, and then personnel next step decisions. But what does any of this have to do with the book of Acts chapter 15, verse 36 and following? The apostle Paul and his colleague Barnabas are in an enviable position. They have successfully completed their first ever missionary journey. And it was marked by hundreds if not thousands of souls have been saved, churches have been planted, and disciple-making is in the process and flourishing. And now months have expired or gone by since their first missionary journey. And in verse number 36, Paul says to Barnabas, let's go and see how they're doing. Let's revisit those churches. What is next? A blow-up, a heated argument. The wheels are about to come off the wagon. What went wrong? They both agreed to revisit the churches, but they could not agree whom to take on the journey. 
It was a disagreement concerning personnel. You see, the next step was in jeopardy whether John Mark should accompany them or not. Because on the first missionary journey, John Mark had quit. He had deserted and abandoned them. And now Paul is minded, no, Mark is not going on this second missionary trip with us. Whereas Bonimus is thinking, wait a minute, Paul, he's young, he's full of potential. We need to extend grace to him. And there was this sharp division between Paul and Barnabas over this young man by the name of John Mark. You see, from Paul's vantage point, John Mark was unfaithful, untrustworthy, and a threat to their success. So the dilemma was this, either tough love or second chance love. And perhaps you have a son who's in college and you have expended tens of thousands of dollars for his education, and to date all that you have to show for it is academic probation. Tough love or second chance love? And whether you know it or not, there are so many John Marks who occupy our pews. John Marks' profile is that he was young, impulsive, inconsistent, easily intimidated, and a risk to flight. You see, the profile is repeated so often among our young people today. Impulsive decision-making. Are they coming or are they going? Inconsistent, that they allow personal circumstances to overrule and overtake their professional obligations. Easily intimidated, when confronted with challenges and disagreement and difficulties, they often become a flight risk. In this morning's message, the next step, Let's learn some important principles to guide us in our next step decision-making regarding ourselves and others. The first point we want to note is point number one, our giftedness influences our decision-making. Our giftedness influences our decision-making. Barnabas is known in the Bible as the son of consolation. The son of consolation literally means the son of encouragement that he had the gift of exhortation, the gift of counseling, the gift of encouragement. And through that giftedness of consolation, encouragement, exhortation, when Barnabas looked at John Mark, he saw a young, discouraged man full of potential who was worthy of an investment of encouragement through time and treasure. But on the other hand, Paul did not have the gift of exhortation, encouragement, or counsel, but rather he had the giftedness of apostleship, prophecy, faith, and teaching. And Paul was all about productivity. Paul says, I labored more than all the apostles, though I was the least of the apostles. Paul was result-oriented. He wanted to be productive. And in Paul's mind, if we bring John Mark on this missionary trip, then I'm going to have to babysit him, and the result is I won't be productive for the Lord. So you have this sharp division. But the thing we need to understand is this, well, who's right and who's wrong? And you know the answer to the question is this? They were both right. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? They had different perspectives because your giftedness influences your decision-making in terms of advising concerning the next step. When you possess a spiritual giftedness that lends itself to the assistance of another person, that when you look at that other person, you can see and determine the next step for them because you have the wherewithal in which you know you have the capacity to influence them for the good. But if your, good, if your gift set does not match the needs of the individual, then you're going to be less likely to perceive what is the next step for the person. So when Paul looked at him, he saw John Mark needs to be held accountable. When Barnabas looked at him, he saw John Mark needs to be extended some grace so that his potential can be realized. Now, beloved, this happens in marriages all the time. The husband has a perspective, the wife has a different perspective, and it's not unusual that they're both right. But here's the problem. Paul did not affirm the perspective that Barnabas had, and Barnabas did not affirm the perspective that Paul had, 
And the result is it led to distraction, dissension, and bitter arguing between the two of them. Beloved, your giftedness influences our decision-making. Let the church say amen. They were both right, but they did not affirm the other. But there's a second thing I want you to notice about the next step. Secondly, the next step may involve a change of working relations. The next step may involve the change of a working relation. Look with me at verse number 39. There was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. Then Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. Beloved, the next step may involve a change of working relations. From this time forward, Paul and Barnabas never served on the same ministry team again. They went their separate ways. There are some of you, you perhaps have a, a supervisor or a manager that was a mentor to you, and you have thrived because of their mentoring. And perhaps they're being transferred to another state or to another department, and you're sort of at a loss, and you're feeling that sense of loss because that significant person will no longer be part of your working relation. You see, beloved, this is what we have to understand is this. Working relationships may change, but Jesus Christ, we are always co-laborers with him. Let the church say amen. The person that you work with, the person that's had such a significant impact over your life vocationally and professionally, the person that you labor with in the kingdom of God or in the church, that relationship, the next step may involve they no longer having a working relationship with you. They may die. They may become incapacitated. They may move away. There might be a rift in the relationship, and that working relationship will no longer be in place. That is life. But we are co-laborers together with Jesus Christ. Beloved, you have to remember that. You see, the working relationships would alter significantly. You say, well, pastor... In what way? You see, young people, those of you who are like John Mark, who are, if you would, spiritual runaways, you've got to understand is this. You cannot run from problems. Let me say that again. You cannot run from problems. You see, in this church, if there is a controversy if there's a difference of personality, if there is a rift, if something goes on in this church that you take exception to, that ruffles your feathers if you would, if you run out of here because of a disappointment or discouragement, understand this, where are you running to? You say, why, Pastor? Because we're their people, their problems. You can't run from problems. Because as soon as you run from a problem, you're going to run into a problem. You see, the only way to get away from problems on this earth is that you got to leave up from here. you got to die to get out of the problems that are on this earth. There are problems regardless where you go. So what is God doing? God uses those problems, those difficulties, those hardships, those disappointments, those reverses to build your character and to make you strong in the Lord. The psalmist David said, it was good that I was afflicted in my youth. David is saying, Lord, you allowed me to go through so much controversy, so many reverses, disappointment, discouragement, abandonment, living in the wilderness, living in caves, being betrayed, and so on and like. And then David says, the Lord teaches my hands to war and maketh my hands to break iron. God was making a man of steel when it came to the psalmist David. And those afflictions took place early in his life. Beloved, if you're going to be something, you got to go through something. And you can't run from your problems if you're going to be something for the Lord. Let the church say amen. 
People want to go to a church where they're happy, 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 happy. You know, if you go to a church where you're always happy, 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 you know what you are? Silly, 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 silly. Because you're not serious. Life is not about being silly. Life is not about always being happy. There's stuff you got to deal with in life. You know who are silly? Little children are silly. Somebody's got to be the adult in the room. Grow up and stop trying to run from your problems and run from things you don't like. Don't run from things that challenge you and confront you. Stay where you are so God can make something of you. Working relations, the next step. They may change. Now you say, well, pastor, what are you trying to tell? I'm telling you to this. You see, God wants us to exercise our spiritual gifts that we might serve others, but God also wants us to exercise our spiritual gifts so that he might give us the spiritual perception to direct people. You see, this is what kind of says this. There are people who go through life and they are always wondering what is the next step. They're clueless. They are sad because they just don't know what's next for my life. God, what is the next step? Whereas those who are in the body of Christ, the Bible says let everything be established by two or three witnesses that as God is directing you, he will bring affirmation and confirmation through the witnesses of two or three persons. And as you are exercising your spiritual giftedness, God gives you spiritual perspective that you can help and guide and assist people in their next step just as they help guide and direct you in your next step. But if you're sitting on your hands and you're not using your spiritual gift, you're neither serving others in the body nor do you have the perspective Perspective for the next step for others in your life. Beloved, we have to exercise our spiritual gifts because they influence us in determining the next step. But there's a third thing I want you to see. Thirdly, this next step may prove to be well documented or obscure. The next step may prove to be well documented or obscure. Now, this is what you have to understand about Paul. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, that's the new ministry team. And after the first missionary journey, there would be the second missionary journey and the third missionary journey. And those journeys are well documented in the scriptures. We have the accounts of those two other missionary journeys. But whereas it came to Barnabas, from that point going forward, his name falls off the pages of scripture. We, do no, we no longer hear about Barnabas after this account here in Acts chapter 15, you say, well, Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? For some, the next step that God has for you will prove to be well documented. In other words, as with Paul, there's some of you here today, God wants to put you in the forefront. He wants to use you publicly. But for others, God sometimes works in the dark. Let the church say amen. He works behind the scenes. And for some of you, the next step is that God wants to put you in a concealed place, obscure place, a, a hidden place, that you're laboring for Christ behind the curtains. You say, well, you, well, what's the difference? You see, it really doesn't make any difference how God uses you, whether he uses you publicly or privately, because the thing you got to understand is this. God sees, God remembers, and God rewards whatever you do in his name. God sees, God remembers, and God rewards whatever things that you do in his name. You don't have to have this big old public ministry in order for God to see you, remember you, and, re and reward you. No. God remembers when you give just a cold glass of water to somebody that's thirsty. Let the church say amen. God sees you when others don't see you. And God remembers when others forget. And God rewards you in a way that others cannot reward you. God, just use me any way you want to use me, but just use me. 
And what happens? The next step, it may prove to be well documented that many will know of the works that you've done in the name of Jesus. Or the next step, if you would, may be a step in which God is using you in obscurity, in obscure, quiet, hidden ways. But nevertheless, the Lord is using you. What is the next step for you and what is the next step for me? The truth of the matter is this. We don't know whether God has a next step for you or the final step for you. None of us know. Let the church say amen. None of us know. Let the church say amen. None of us know. But this is the thing that you can take soul and sin is this. Regardless of whether God has a next step for you or you are approaching the final step, if you're following Jesus Christ, then you're taking good steps. If you're following Jesus Christ, then you are taking good steps. You see, a righteous man, a good man, his steps are ordered by the Lord. Who was right? Who was wrong? Well, when you look at verses 39 and verse number 40, something's interesting. The Lord says that when Paul and Silas left, that the brethren, if you would, commended them to the grace of God and sent them away. And of course, Paul and Silas and Timothy, their journeys proved to be uh, successful. But the Bible does not tell us the same regarding, Paul, regarding Barnabas and John Mark. It doesn't say that the brothers commended them to the grace of God. It simply tells us that Barnabas and John Mark went on their way. But we do know this, that Barnabas' investment in young John Mark would pay huge dividends. You say, what do you mean? John Mark, much of his Christian experience, like some of you, he was a constant flight risk. In what context? You remember when Jesus was arrested? And when he was arrested at Garden Gethsemane, there was a young man that was apprehended, that was grabbed. And that young man was John Mark. And the Bible tells us that when he was grabbed, he literally ran out of his clothes from where he was. He ran out of his outer garment and fled the arrest scene, lest he be arrested as well. John Mark was a constant flight risk. His mother's name was Mary, a wid the widowed Mary. And Mary, his mother, was a devout follower of Jesus. But because she was a widow, John Mark was young. He grew up without a father. Barnabas was John Mark's cousin or uncle and he knew the family because they were blood related and this man Barnabas he invested in John Mark to such an extent that two things would be realized that John Mark would write the gospel according to Mark and according to Bible scholars it is the first chronological written gospel in the Bible of the four gospels Chronologically, in terms of time sequence, it was the first ever written gospel by a flight risk impulsive young man. And later in life, when Paul would come to the near end of his ministry, he would instruct, bring Mark because he is profitable unto the ministry. That Paul, who had little confidence in John Mark decades before, near the end of his life, he realizes and he witnessed that John Mark has become an incredible servant of Jesus Christ, dependable, trustworthy, and capable for Christ, that the second gospel bears his name. The question is, would we have a John Mark? if it were not for a man with the gift of exhortation, counsel, and encouragement by the name of Barnabas.
I thank God that Barnabas exercised his spiritual gift and his spiritual perceptions because if he had not, John Mark would never have achieved and accomplished what God has set out for him. Let the church say amen. The next step, your next step, is highly contingent upon others pouring and investing in you. And the next step for others is highly contingent upon you investing in them. And as we invest in one another, we become increasingly aware what the next step is. And once we know what the next step is for us, listen, individually, then we begin to perceive what is the next step for us corporately as a church. We begin to see the vision that God has for this church and how each of us are to be moving in that direction because we have apprehended, if you would, the next step for us personally and the next step for us corporately. Whether it's the next step or the final step, you're making good steps if you're following Jesus. Let's stay and look to the Lord in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the wisdom of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that your servants who served you well, whether it be Paul or Barnabas, and though they had their disagreements, Lord, and Lord, they in reality both were right, but they failed to affirm one another's perspective. And so, Father, we pray today, Lord, that you give us the wherewithal that we have a discerning heart and mind Lord, that we can affirm one another, encourage one another, and support one another in the vision and in the next step that you have for each of our lives. Father, help us to stay put. Help us to endure challenges, reverses, disappointments, discouragement, Lord, because, God, we can't run from problems. We only run into problems. So, Father, help us to stay put and to do your sacred will. Now, Father, bless your children because you are our blessed Father. We ask this all in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen.